Trivial Peace knew I was media as soon as I walked into his bar. The tell was not just that he didn't recognize me. Trivial Peace isn't great with names, he says, but he knows most patrons by their drink orders. Bush Light, Pint, Whiskey and Coke keeps his straws, but more so that newcomers usually take a moment to admire the impressive collection of sports memorabilia, whereas my eyes went straight to the security cameras. Before agreeing to speak to me, he asked for my driver's license and set about making sure that I was not with Fox News. We're in mourning and we're a small town and we know what's going to happen, he said to me. You guys are going to okay. go. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You can stop there, <laughs> sorry. No, just, just that little piece, okay. Uh, okay. Welcome Kathleen Hale. Uh, Kathleen's the, uh, she's an author, but also the writer of this uh, uh, article just from a couple of days ago, four days ago. Um, Kathleen, how long were you in Moscow? Um, I was in Moscow for a whole week, so a um, Sunday through Saturday, yeah. Okay. And what happened immediately after that? So you, a Trivial Peace uh, is the owner of the Corner Club, is that right? Yeah, Mark Trivial Peace is the owner of the Corner Club where um, Maddie Mogan and Kaylee Gonsalves spent their last evening alive. Okay, so what happened next? Like, instead of going to the article, he asked for your ID, right? Yeah, so by the time that I showed up at the Corner Club, um, it was about three weeks after the murders. And so the Corner Club had really been inundated with reporters uh, wanting, you know, security camera footage, wanting statements from Mark, wanting statements from his uh, student employees, wanting statements from his you know, customers. And so when I showed up, Mark was sick of it. Like he, um, he and I laugh now about the fact that when I walked in, he was like, what do you want? And he was very sort of standoffish. But when I told him what I was sort of focusing on in the piece, he uh, felt like it was a different angle than one that others were taking. And he had a lot to say about, um, you know, my angle. And my angle was, you know, how is the Internet affecting Moscow and the people in it after these murders occur and so he he was he talked to me about it and I felt really lucky because he trusted he trusted me in spite of a lot of the experiences that he had had with um, reporters prior to that yeah I think that's a conversation a lot of those folks actually want to have where in a way they see the bad guy not necessarily as just Koberger but these other actors and participants right yeah yeah definitely so what's quite strange is um, this, there seems to be like a tide. I don't know whether it's because um, true crime has gotten bigger. It, it sort of seems to be growing at a geometric rate or something. I don't know. It just seems to be expanding, um, you know, like like a bell curve or something. I don't know. It just seems to be really growing. Now, I mean, I, when, when, you, when we covered the Chris Watts case, it was like this is, couple of orders of magnitude greater than the previous high profile case and then the next one you kind of had the same thing Kylie Rodney then dwarfed all the other cases um Jack Gabby Petito was the same yeah. this Idaho case feels the same um the the attention to the murder trial you know you see a million people in chat in on some channels whatever so it just feels like People are getting more and more connected and the networks are sort of being set up, but that's, that's also led to the rise of the ghoul, yeah. you know, um, and um, every creator is like, I'm not a ghoul, you are, you know, like I'm good, um, you know what I mean? And yeah. so you, you do need a little bit of self-reflection to say, am I part of the the thing that's interfering with the healing process mm -hmm. and when you were in moscow did, did you have a little bit of a sense of that you got to trade i mean obviously you did with trouble piece but when you went to i presume you went to king road right yes i spent a lot of time on king road and there were definitely the the part of the job that i like the least is knocking on doors and asking if people want to talk and I was just pretty, I could feel from people in general who were living in Moscow that they were just tired of it. 
you know, in some ways the media presence was becoming even, I mean, I don't want to say worse than the crime itself, but it was just affecting their daily life every single day. And, um, and so I was, I was aware of sort of like my role in, in that machine of, um, of media attention and, and, and what that does to people and how it makes them feel. Um, and what I sort of came away realizing, and I, and I, I sort of researched a lot cause I, I did want to sort of reckon with my own true crime obsession and like, where does that fall on this spectrum of, of, um, of pre-internet interest in true crime and, and sort of where we are now with people getting, um, grieving people getting sort of canceled, you know, by, by Seuss in a way. And what I sort of came away with is that, you know, it's, it's part of human nature to, to gravitate toward these stories because it like allows us to reckon with our own existential anxieties in a, in a sort of contained way. Um, the dip- there's a, sorry to interrupt you. There's yeah. a, there's a paragraph where you refer to that. Do you want to, do you want to read that paragraph where you talk about um it's yeah. human nature okay okay cool so there's something deeply human about fascination with crime the central enigma of murder is death a painful reality that comes for us all and one that we instinctively fight throughout our lives differentiating ourselves from victims like mortensen and her housemate by judging their choices and hunting their killers as if that protects us from random acts of violence but whatever we might learn at Brian Koberger's trial, there can never be a tolerable explanation for what happened to Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Santa Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin. We want to believe in social media's immense power to reverse or at least rectify injustices. The alternative is that we've bought into a massive conspiracy, surfing and shaming and buying, fooled by the idea that our addiction to screens is productive, virtuous, Never mind the destruction we leave in our wake. Okay. So what is your theory of the case and what have you thought about why? Because uh, I know you wrote a previous article. I, I seem to remember you wrote a previous article where you quoted what somebody else had said about what they thought happened. Uh, have you developed your thought process on that? <laughs> um, so I definitely have... I, I have some like theories, I guess, um, but nothing that made it into either of the articles because, you know, you can't fact check a theory and these pieces had to be completely um, fact checked. And I, I hesitate to, to share it because like I've never, ever been right. Like that's the thing about me is like I do write about these things, but my hunches are usually off base. So... <laughs> Okay, well, that's actually very respectable because this genre is inundated with people who are absolutely convinced that they are absolutely right. And that's part of what makes them popular. It's like, I have the answer. Uh, come to me for as the font of wisdom. So it's actually quite refreshing to see someone saying, I'm not sure. And then, I mean, um, until the trial comes out, we can't be absolutely sure really of anything. But... Um, there's something you said in that, and I mean, I'm I'm coming from somewhere else where you know I've written over 100 books, most of them on true crime. Um, I've posted over a thousand videos on on my True Crime Rocket Science channel. Um, just trying to see what what it was that caught my eye. Um, um, where you said, um, whatever we might learn at Coburg's trial, there can never be a tolerable explanation. And I know where you're coming from, you know, that um, it's almost like no matter what the explanation is, you, you kind of can't justify or, or in a way explain murder, right? Yeah. But I must say, I come from a totally different perspective from the sense of, I studied law. I've, I've, in the very first case that I dealt with, I didn't like say I'm not going to deal with this case. I sort of just covered the story of 
of um, so it's, it's in Oscar Pistorius case and there's the story of the victim whose voice never got heard mm -hmm. and I just sort of felt like isn't it time we tell her story and what 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 sort of fascinated me and and in a way horrified me was that there was a narrative that was going on throughout and I was like this this narrative is just not right and people thought I was the idiot. They were like, who are you? Are you a photographer? What? And I kind of got um, a lot of criticism and so on. And um, ultimately, um, the original verdict was overturned and, and all of the original pundits were overruled. And I, I, I thought like, well, you can see from a mile away what has happened here, right? And so and 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 the, what made it all worse was, was this was happening while the world was watching you sort of got this feeling well when if the world is watching surely justice will be done and that was perhaps the most terrifying thing of all is like no um justice is very hard one and, and there's there's distortions and so on and, and so from that series of narratives on the oscar Pistorius case i felt like um isn't that the most important question is why do these things happen both from the criminal psychology perspective so out of the mind of the murderer like where did he come from like like let's walk in issues not in a not in a sympathetic way not even in a compassionate way just in a who is this person where did they come from it's, it's not really a judgmental way it's simply just what happened here what's the reality here right that's the one side of it. And the other side is what factors in society, like a lot of people love to think that that criminals are evil and, and the rest of us are good. But but criminals were good once upon a time and, and they come out of society. You know, all criminals and you, you get criminals who people would say, I would never have imagined he would have committed the crime like Chris Watts, right? Like he never did anything wrong. He never lost his temper, this, that and the next thing. And so someone is a good person, a good member, sometimes a, a good member of society, a good citizen until they commit a crime, which in a way suggests that we are all capable of criminality. Now, I do differentiate criminal psychology from ordinary psychology, and a lot of psychologists don't recognize that. But the point that I'm trying to make is I think it's a very important aspect, and it's so um miss uh, it's so underappreciated by the mainstream media you'll have like th this case for example you'll have so much evidence discussed you'll have the crime scene um photographed and so on i've sat in on trials where this has happened if they talk about every detail and then and then you sort of come out the other side of this washing machine of uh, this maelstrom of coverage and at, at the end it's like Okay, but so why did this happen? Oh, we don't know. Let's move on to the next case. And yeah. to me, if you can't address why, won't address why, and fail to address why, when I say fail, I mean you ask the question. If you can't find a satisfactory answer, doesn't that suggest history is going to repeat itself? Because you, a problem exists, and you don't have the, you don't have an actual explanation for it. Yeah, I I guess I I guess I wonder if um, if the stuff that comes out in a trial ever actually prevents future crimes. I'm not I'm not quite sure that it does. Um, I don't necessarily think that criminals or people who become criminals are thinking about the law at all, or like precedent or previous cases or you know, the risk of death penalty or anything when they commit a crime because um, they just assume that they're going to get away with it. I totally understand where you're coming from, though, about how it's important to have these trials and to get all the information out and to, to walk away understanding what we can because that's understanding it is is very, you know, cathartic as like a as a voyeur. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a difference between something becoming understandable and something becoming tolerable yeah i get what you're saying but what i also think is necessary or what, what i think maybe the best way to um the best way to express it is to say wouldn't it be something 
if we could find an explanation, wouldn't it be something if we could explain this, right? And um, uh, something you said earlier about some, you know, people don't think about the law, or whatever. Well, we've just had the Murdoch case, who's a lawyer. Yeah. Who was thinking, but I mean, that's a little bit exceptional. In this case, it's quite strange that it's a criminal, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, criminology student. So I, I don't know if he was thinking about the law, but I think he was thinking about evidence and he was thinking in that that respect. Right. And what you see more and more is that criminals actually study true crime, that they, they, they watch cases and, and things like that. And um, the impression I get is that a, a lot of people don't know what they're talking about. That's the, just the impression I get. There are a lot of cases where 90 percent of the Internet thinks something and then it's not the case. Right. And then you sort of feel like Tip as a slightly intelligent criminal might be thinking, this is going to be so easy. So it's going to be so easy to fool these people, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And yeah, and that, that was one of the things that struck me about this case is that there were so many theories and people were using, you know, real names of people who were peripheral to this case. And, and so even when those theories don't end up being true, it's not like, they're redacted or erased from the internet. You know, it's not like Reddit yeah. goes through and gets rid of the wrong theories. And so then what ends up happening is people like the surviving roommates in this case, who are both college students, one of them is 19. Her name is always going to be linked to these sort of threads where people are theorizing that she was involved in a massive crime. And if you're a future employer of hers and you're Googling her or whatever, and you're linked to these sort of conspiracy theory threads that like are so insane that maybe they sound a little true. Are you going to hire her? Or are you going to hire someone else who's capable, who isn't as controversial? Um, and and that was something mm. that kind of continually came up against. You could have like long term damage, and I don't know. I've um, I feel very different to a lot of other YouTubers. I sort of I don't even feel like you should mention the names of the survivors, you should just refer to them as D and, and M, sorry, D and B, right? Right, because yeah. that's what, that's the precedent of the affidavits, right? Yes. And, and um, so, so you'll have a YouTuber like me, who will be like, okay, I'll rather not show a photo and I'll rather not say their name. And the audience is kind of going, no, 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 I want to know about this story. Show me her face. What's her name? What did she do wrong? And so, so actually doing things the right way, you actually get punished for that. It's like, yeah. no, 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 I want all the details. And, and, and you don't really get credit for the fact that you're actually honoring the survivor. You know, and there's another case I just want to mention very quickly. I just saw something a few minutes ago where someone who was trying to look for their friend, that's the Nicola Bully case, someone who's trying to look for her friend she goes to the media and she talks to the media. She then becomes, um, let's find red flags. Let's try and analyze this. Um, is she suspicious? I'm sure she's got to be. And, and then you kind of think to yourself, woe, woe um, is you if one of your best friends disappears and now you, and you just want to look for them. You're going to yeah. become prime suspect, the go-to target, because there's nobody else really, right? Yeah. Just like literally... I want to find my friend. I want to find out what happened to my friend. Let's make you the suspect. Oh, yeah. You so, know? well, I think it's like it's. I think it's really cool and respectable that that you handle the the other victims the way that you do in terms of not using their names. It's very rare. Um, but the, what I, I think a lot of sorry to interrupt. What I think a lot of social media don't don't realize is they think they on an unlimited credit card to play the whole wild west thing and and what's starting to happen is uh reality starting to catch up with them people are recognizing that it's the wild west and it's and you know um youtube isn't separate so separate from reality that the law doesn't apply right so you're starting to actually have um situations like you have in idaho where there's where they're very quickly saying Let's just demolish this house. Let's cut the um, 
nip it in the bud, nip, nip all this, this negative press in the bud. And, um, and then you, you're also getting the law catching up with certain of the worst transgressors, like I won't mention their names, but people are literally breaking the law. And then the crazy thing is when they are subpoenaed, when they, when they served with a season's desist, it's almost like, oh, I, I've, instead of going, oh crap, I've done something wrong. I, I'm a stop. It's kind of like, this is a sign that I'm on the right track. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, woo. <laughs> yeah, you're so right. Anyway, so uh, can you please read the point number three that we highlighted, the third one, and then we'll read the first one a little bit later. I think we haven't read the first one yet. Um, since Koberger's arrest, so-called suspects like Jack Showalter, Jack Decor, Gonsalves' ex-boyfriend, and Chapin's fraternity brothers have been exonerated by reality. Though who knows what kind of psychological or professional toll this kind of experience exacts. One of the surviving roommates, Dylan Mortensen, however, continues to withstand a huge amount of abuse. Mortensen and the other surviving roommate, Bethany Funky, both named as victims in prosecutorial filings, were pilloried on social media, a friend of theirs told me, alleging that one self-appointed detective posted pictures of Mortensen and Funky every day, analyzing their evil expressions and accusing them of the crime. I'm going to say something you're probably not going to like very much. but I, just, just, yeah. Huh? yeah, go ahead. Now, it's just that the criticism of the survivors isn't totally without merit, right? Mm -hmm. There, there is there is a natural thing to say. Then you hear something. Absolutely. Didn't you, right. Yeah. So, that, that's a so, really. Good yeah. yeah. And so so that's true. But then the next thing is also true, which is they didn't commit this crime. They are not. They shouldn't be um, uh, set up and shot down. You know the way that they are. Yeah. Um, and. The thing that I'm very sensitive to, especially coming from the Kylie Rodney case, are you um, familiar with that case? No, I'm not. So Kylie Rodney was a 16-year-old who um, who uh, accidentally drove into a lake and drowned and disappeared. And then there were YouTube was sort of turning the closest people to her into prime suspects. Yeah. Right? And I was looking at this and thinking. Does nobody realize these are minors? And, and if they're not minors, they're 17 year olds and they're 18 year olds, right? It's not like, to, to some extent, I think um, certain prime suspects who are legitimately, to some extent, legitimately uh, suspects deserve a certain amount of scrutiny. So, for example, in the Murdoch case, you didn't know whether Alex Murdoch had murdered his wife and son. But you did know that he was there was a lot of smoke around fraud and other things, right? So you can say in a case like that, you 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 are deservedly a, a lightning rod for a certain amount of scrutiny, right? But yeah. th none of that applies when you're dealing with a 16 or 17 year old who who is going to act in a way that's a little bit strange because they're still trying to find who they are, yeah. right? That, that's and and, and, and then uh, you, you saw over and over again on different channels. I'm just speculating. Um, you speculating, why can I not speculate? You're speculating with someone's life, and if you're wrong, you can actually leave a permanent imprint on that person's life where they're scared of the world, right? And, um, and then we come into the Idaho case, and it's, um, it's a situation of, um, slightly older kids, they're now university level, but they're still young, they're 20, 21, 22. And, um, and to me, the, the way, because um, I can definitely put up my hand and say, I also thought that surely it's one of the people closest to one of the victims. I was right. one of the people who said, I think it could be this one or that one. But, but I, where, I, where I deviated was I didn't, really say the person's name. I didn't yeah. I didn't show their face really. And I didn't so I was basically saying, for example, I called him hoodie guy. Everybody knows who that is, but I'm not saying his name. Yeah. Not, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's I think the fine line, because I've studied law and I'm aware of 
having written so many books, we we trying to speculate on motive, even in a case that we, we didn't go to trial, like the Madeleine McCann case and the John Monet Ramsey case. There's a way to address certain questions without getting yourself into a legal mindfulness. And one of them is you make the case just based on evidence that's already in the media narrative. You're just repeating that part of the media narrative, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or you or you can criticize a version of events that doesn't make sense. You don't need to say, like you see, and that's so crazy when you watch something like the murder trial, you, you see people writing in all caps, guilty, exclamation mark. And it's like, do you realize what we are here to do? We're here to listen. We, yeah. we are not the court. You are not a juror. And people don't realize you're crossing a line when you do that. You, you are, it's actually defamatory. Yeah. yeah. If yeah. you're going to say guilty, you must be very prepared to go to court. And now you must prove that. Not the lawyer, not Crichton Waters. If you're going to say someone's guilty, you need to go be prepared to go to court and, and make the case. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> right? Yeah. But all I'm saying is YouTube, uh, I don't know, it's like uh, it incentivizes witch hunts. And there is a proper way to do this where you can make certain arguments without crossing those lines. But but YouTube doesn't seem to, a lot of the community doesn't seem to be aware of that kind of subtlety. And the other thing that I think needs to happen, you're a journalist, I'm kind of a recovering, it's almost like alcoholic, recovering journalist, recovering author, but I don't want to recover, put it that way. <laughs> Uh, because I, I'm a former magazine journalist and I don't t intend to sort of go back. But um, we are aware that if you make, as you just said, you make unsubstantiated statements, the publication that publishes it can be sued and you can be sued as well. And yeah. I've had a couple of instances where I've made certain statements, um, very rarely, very, very few. I, I was once writing about the South African cycling um a federation and I repeated what someone had told me and um, and then there was something like that pending can you prove that this guy said that and then I said yes I can I can prove it here it is right yeah. so you've got to be very careful yeah and so that's what a lot of people in social media don't recognize is they don't recognize that with journalists you are trained and told that what you say you've got to be able to back up and prove otherwise you can literally be sued and that standard isn't applying yet to social media now, i'm not sure if it ever will to the same extent because of because of uh, first amendment rights and things like that but I, I also think it needs to catch up more than it already has Do you agree with that it, it'll be interesting to see how that lawsuit that you alluded to will play out i think that that could have a real impact on how how people, you know, interact online, um, mm. because uh, you know, if if I mean, it's the if that if that lawsuit, if she, if she isn't held accountable in any way, if if they can't get her to pay, if they can't, you know, get her engaged in that, I think it'll continue. But perhaps if there is some kind of like repercussion, um, it could change the way that people think about what they say online. So we're about halfway into our discussion. I want to talk about Brian Enton. I know you met him and and I kind of think of him as the gold standard in true crime reporting. You know, he's like, he's a gentleman, he's, he's very authentic, he's very fact-based, um, he's also very he's sort of well-mannered. He, he knows how to um, get a story, but also not cross those lines, right? So yeah. I, wanted, uh, I, I want to talk about that. Can you, uh, as a way to sort of open that, can you read that? I think it's number one. Yeah. yeah. For four days, Enton and I ate together, stood in the cold together, and sat squished together in the daddy wagon. And for that entire time, he remained genuinely upbeat and shockingly low maintenance, finding joy in simple pleasures like eating a ball of mystery mush that might have been mashed potatoes or something else. I love it, he said, still not knowing what it was. It has a little spice. He never complained, 
not even when a waiter served him a salad topped with walnuts, to which Enton is allergic. I'm just picking around them, he said. When he saw the dark hallways and bumpy rock walls in my hotel, which reminded me of a medieval torture movie, he pointed out the bright side. It looked tornado-proof. Only one thing seemed to make him nervous. Me. On our first day together, he worried that I might be doing like a bad article. He met my gaze, wanting to make sure I can trust you, right? What was your impression of Brian Enton like in person? He's delightful. He's he's a fantastic person. Um, you know, we spent so much time together, often in uncomfortable uh, conditions, and he is just exactly how he comes across. And um, you know, he is kind of like the last dodo bird of uh, news anchoring. He he checks ev everything he says. <laughs> yeah. And. You know, it, it's, I guess it's surreal and strange that that's not standard practice, but it isn't. And so I just really respected him. I related to him. I enjoyed his company. And everyone that he works for and with loves him. News Nation loves him. Brian's fans love him. And his team loves him, which is saying a lot because it's a team of three people. And they spend a lot of time in physically, uh, in physical close proximity to each other um, and, you know, holding on to each other, trying not to die in a hurricane. So um, he does everything. And I just, I was, I was really blown away by him. I just thought he was such a star. I think what he brings to the table is he's extremely resilient. Is it extremely tough? Like you say, he can suffer. Uh, he puts himself out there. I mean, uh, what is incredible was you know, when all the other journalists and reporters had abandoned ship, kind of, you know, like they'd left Moscow, he was still there, he was still standing there in the cold, you know, and it was like snow, night and day, and he was standing there, and, you know, whenever um, Ashley Banfield needed him on scene, he was there, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I, I think the only person who was suffering more than he was, and, and it's obviously someone on shift with, with those cops in the patrol vehicles, you know, stationed outside the house. But I mean, they they get off a shift and then someone else comes in, you know? Yeah. But I mean, um, he was like, when everyone else had left, he was still there. And, um, you know, I, I also, um, also like to cover true crime in the same way you don't, you're not like a butterfly and you go from flower to flower. You, you spend time on a, on a big story, you spend time on it and you see it through. And when you do that, it's so, so much more um, valuable, meaningful, you know, and so on. And, um, and and that also addresses that question about, can we come up with a tolerable explanation? And, and maybe you can take the word tolerable away. Can, can we come up with some explanation? Well, when you are on scene like that, constantly, you get under the, the veneer uh, the, the people start to get to know you and you get to know them, you know, and that's a big part of it, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, did, um, I think in your article, you, you mm -hmm. talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of say it on your behalf because it's a little bit tricky territory to say without saying, but you talk about a particular YouTuber who, um, is quite rash. <laughs> uh, her, her name starts with the letter B. I'm not going to say who she is, but she kind of comes on scene and and does certain things. And 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 I think you asked him if I, I can't quite remember the. I think you asked him either what he thought about her or what his opinion. And and then he he didn't criticize her. Yeah, he was. He's a really. Um like kind of elegant, diplomatic, uh, super non-judgmental non guy. And what I realized about him is that, you know, he doesn't just have to stand outside these crime scenes with other reporters who are often from stations that kind of look down on News Nation um, and they let that show. He stands outside the crime scenes with people who are not from uh, 
like new stations who maybe have a YouTube channel or something else. And he treats everyone with equal kindness. He really, he, he's, he, I thought that that was great, you know, because the reality is that, that both types of true crime, um, you know, all sorts of people do true crime coverage now and they need to be able to coexist in these spaces harmoniously without, um, you know, turning on one another, I guess. And, and I saw him doing that, uh, whereas other people were not. What, what I've um, learned to, I don't always appreciate it. I sometimes need to try and remember this, but what I've kind of learned over months and years in true crime is that as much as you may see another writer, another creator in a, in a way that totally, I don't want to say revolts you, but it's, it's totally it's not your your style it's not your taste you know it, it seems very really tasteless yeah they um they are a reflection of their audience the fact that they there means that there's a whole segment that yeah. does like them you know they are providing a they are providing a voice to a particular um uh well, I, i'm not quite sure how to put it a particular ailment in society that that resonates with that particular segment and then there's another one that they want to talk about it in that way and so what to me is actually quite fascinating is if you see um how popular certain channels are based on certain people talking about certain things you realize they represent an audience yeah they're representative and that's reality. Whether you like it or not, that's reality. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. So a, a, a conversation I've been having with my subscribers and a, and a um, what do you call it? A, yeah, the thing that I've been trying to think about is if you followed the IDO case, you kind of got this sense of a competition between law enforcement trying to investigate the case and to some extent social media and the media trying to report on the case but also trying to investigate almost like a parallel investigation we're going to do our investigation you do yours kind of thing we know you're not telling us everything so we're going to find it out in our own way and yeah. and um What's really interesting is in the UK, there's been another case, the Nicola Bully case, where they feel the social media coverage overwhelmed the investigation to such an extent that law enforcement felt that felt compelled to say, OK, we know this. And then they got um, lambasted for revealing what they felt was personal information. It's like you damned if you do, damned yeah. if you don't. Oh, yeah. What came out, what came out very in a very interesting way in that case, which is in a way mirrored in this case is, and I think it's quite an interesting question for journalists like you to think about, but if you if, if you say in a case like the Ido case where there's a, a it's high profile, it's shocking, people are paying attention to it, who should control the narrative and how should the narrative be controlled? And, and you might say it in two ways. You might say, okay, law enforcement should control the narrative, right? So if you say that, then you say, okay, well, how? How do they, should they have their own social media accounts? Should they engage with social media? Should they believe social media? Should they call out social media? Th then the other side of it is you say, it's impossible for law enforcement to do that. They are not social media. They've got to do their jobs. But yet social media is this force, a force for good that can be and a force for ill. And it, it did feel like um, I thought Moscow PD were very smart in how they handled it and it seemed like they gave a, um, you know, like they give a dog a bone. It seems like they gave social media a bone in terms of the white Elantra. Yeah. Off you go social media, go and find a white Elantra. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas they were already following it really at that point. I mean, they actually knew everything. Um, but I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Um, I mean, one possibility is that that law enforcement, and I think they do this quite often, law enforcement have a favorite go-to channel 
you know, like a, a mainstream media channel where they tell them what they know and that way they kind of indirectly control the narrative. Yeah, I, I don't really think it shouldn't be controlled. Um, I don't necessarily think that the narrative should be or can be controlled. Um, but I do think that it's interesting it, to look at this in terms of um, time and time passing. And what I mean by that is that, you know, you, you mentioned before that the surviving roommates, you know, inability to call 911 until much, much later, that raises a lot of questions. Yes, it does. Those questions will be answered at trial. And and let's say that the trial happens in six months or a year, we're still going to find out, we're going to get those answers, she's going to testify. Why do we need to know right now? What does that change? You, well, you know? I can tell you as uh, someone who, who started turning around books in like two weeks, yeah. right? And someone who tries to, uh, I'm, not, I'm not nearly as current as I used to be, I used to, the moment a news story breaks, you on YouTube, you live, whatever. I don't really do that anymore. But the answer is that we live in an extremely um, just-in-time society. Uh, our, the supply lines are just in time, but we are we are more than ever. And, and, and true crime is a very big, good example of that. Um, you hear about a crime, the next thing you're there, you've got drones flying over the place. And it's so immediate. And then, and then there's this weird thing of, there's this kind of weird schism between that happened and, and, and we've got all of this access. We've got, you know, lots of people running around with cameras and we can see into this house, but we've got to wait. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and we can talk to all their friends and we can look at all their friends' email. I mean, sorry, we can not email, that would be crazy, but social media pages and like try to figure it out ourselves. Totally. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's one thing to be interested in the stuff, watching it unfold, talking to each other about it. But I think maybe we could also be a little bit more cognizant of our own impatience and just be aware that that's a piece of it as well. Um, what and happens with that vacuum where, where law enforcement say, and I understand it very well because I've covered trials and so on, and they take a heck of a long time. The Lori Vella case is just about who start the Letitia store case I wrote a book about that ages ago kind of even forgotten the details is about to go to trial now you've got other cases like Suzanne Morphew that just has fizzled away the 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 legal process seems to move at an agonizing pace yeah but it's because we're not at the front lines they are actively getting information and having interviews so they they are the law enforcement are satisfied with what they're doing and what they know. We not, right. and we, we feel like we've got a right to know. But what I think a lot of people don't realize, especially even even um, seasoned YouTubers, they don't realize that you can contaminate, you can infect, you can you can um, have a situation that that um, me, makes a, a court case yes. untenable. And I think what's going to happen in future, it hasn't really happened yet in a high profile case. Arguably, it hasn't. You, you might argue that in the Jeff versus Heard case that it did happen. But um, you can have a case where the, so, the, the social, it's so high profile and the social media is so saturated and, and there's so many people on social media that, that, it, that it's going to be kind of impossible to have a trial. And you might need to have things like trained jurors not not it's not like just someone off the street you're going to need someone that is actually it's actually a new system where you need to train jurors and, and they are educated to some extent in the law and they there is something like that i'm not uh, anyway and then they um um are aware of the law in a much to a much greater degree they don't go and look at a hashtag that's trending and decide no, you're not allowed to go and look on on social media, but you do. Yeah. Oh, and that 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 hashtag's trending. I don't want to become the target of the court of public opinion, so I'm just going to go with the court of public opinion. That's right. going to happen. That that is in the future of high profile cases, and that's why I feel you can't sort of say this is my opinion. You might say bullshit, but you can't say 
I don't know if it should, if the narrative should be controlled. I right. feel like there's a legal imperative that it has to be controlled. You can't yeah. just let it, and that is why you have sealed, all of these sealed documents. That's why, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's to protect the, it's actually to protect the perpetrator from, from having unfair information out there, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's actually to, to protect him, but also in order that he can be fairly prosecuted. It's a weird inversion. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's a very hard one. Like, what do you do? Do you, do you have totally sequestrated jurors? Uh, do you have professional jurors? What, how do you do that? But I, I think you've got to ask this question. How can law enforcement, for example, control the narrative? How do they do that? Yeah, I mean, there was something interesting that was happening when I was in Moscow, which is that the police department decided to interview themselves. <laughs> They had been yeah, giving, yeah, yeah, yeah. doing press press interviews um, and announcements that way, and it was it was quite. I mean, I, I think that they're very sweet people, the Moscow police, and they did an incredible job. The video is a bit awkward, but I agree that that could be the future of sort of press interaction. Rather than you know filtering their announcements through the press, they could do their own uh, video releases or whatever. That could be very cool. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to be something that many many people are, are really doing yet, and they didn't they didn't look very comfortable with it. Yeah. But well, it, another another thing they did was very early on they addressed, and and it was in a way quite subtle. So one of the things they said in some of their very first press conferences was they said none of the victims were hogtied. Yeah. Remember that. And um, what was the other thing? Um, well, I know there was this thing that was reported in the media about the screaming and so on, but what was quite interesting with that was they were actually not, without naming any names, they were calling out someone who was spreading lies. Right? Yes. And I think you're going to see that, and I actually think you need to see that more often. You don't need to even mention the name. Social media will figure it out. Uh, that's, that's what they there for. Because <laughs> yeah. like, even in this chat, when I said, there's a YouTuber who dot, 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 people in chat were saying, I think I know who it is, right? It's the same yeah. kind of thing. You don't need to uh, do that, uh, but you, you do need to address that. That is a, a, a false rumor. Yes. And then, and then, and this is to me the important part. Social media needs to hold social media accountable. Yeah, that's a right? really good point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, that makes total sense. Like, you know, people in the same universe sort of calling each other out and trying to come up with sort of like an industry gold standard. Um, I mean, I think that what you do is really cool and the fact that you want to inspire other, you know, social media people to, to, to act the same way is, is amazing. And yeah, their rumor control page was good um, for that reason. It was also helpful as a journalist to have that I, you know, during that time, there were people going, uh, experts and stuff, like researchers talking about how when you call out um, an untrue rumor online, it actually gives it more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you don't say, you don't say their name. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's one of the perils of this whole thing is you say you say someone, uh, you know, that what they're doing is wrong, and then they suddenly get credibility. Yeah. You know, yeah. they suddenly in invert it. Like, law enforcement, don't trust them, but they mentioned me, they're trying to shut me down because I'm telling the truth. You know, it's that, yeah. that sort of argument. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to play a short clip uh, where Brian Enton is talking. Uh, he's actually unusually in, in a suit and tie in the News Nation studio. We're just going to listen to a little bit of that and then we're going to come back. I, I, I realize we've got 10 minutes to go. So I've, I've got my eye on the clock. So this is when he's in News Nation? Like yeah, I, yeah. I ask, he told me that when he's back there, he can feel his like legs swinging off the stool and he feels oh, like... Oh, really? That's, that's really funny. <laughs> he feels yeah. like a little kid at the grown-ups table. Like, what the fuck am I doing here? But I must say, I... Um, I love the Brian Enton approach, like that, where you do go and um, immerse yourself. I, I really like it. I mean, I think there are a lot of ghouls who do that in a horrible way and they harass. 
I'd like I like the Brian Enton approach to true crime where you you go into the area and you you know it's it's first hand but you yeah. do it in the proper way and that is the way proper true crime should should be done he's really the gold standard in that yeah but I'm going to play a quick uh, piece I want you while while you listening to it just to think about because in your in your article I think in the blurb in the sort of subheading you, you sort of mentioned that news nation has really come out on the other side of the the idaho coverage i don't know if it's just that but certainly a big part of it i, I think they i don't know what how many subscribers they had at the beginning if it was two hundred thousand or whatever but they're now at seven hundred thousand they've, they've definitely at least wow. doubled in size yeah um, but i want you to think about um this idea that they have been a force for good. I, I think they've definitely been almost your go-to channel for covering the case. But the other side of it is, like, I'm a big fan of Brian Enton, but there's been other coverage besides Brian Enton's coverage on News Nation in the face of um, a gag order, in the face of, in, in other words, there's been evidence or there's been... I don't know what you can call it, rumors or statements made that have been associated with some of the survivors that are actually in conflict with the affidavit. And, and, and that, to me, raises all sorts of problems. Who do you trust now? Do you trust law enforcement or News Nation? You know what I mean? In the context of there's a gag order and we're trying to get to trial, and now, you get, get, now you're getting a split of two narratives and now it's like, well, now who do you trust? And that actually already starts to raise doubt. Uh, what's going on here? Yeah. You know? Okay, so let me play this. I hope we can hear. All of this evidence together, and there's a lot of it, you read all of it out like that. Uh, what does it tell us about Koberger? Let's bring in Robert, uh, Robin Dreek, a retired FBI special agent and head of the counterintelligence uh, NCE behavioral analysis program, and Katie Tchaikovsky. Uh, she's a criminal defense attorney uh, and a former federal prosecutor. Thank you both so much for being with us. Uh, Robin, I, I want to start with you. You heard me list out all of those items, everything we know, uh, and it's come in in bits and pieces, so it's interesting to lay it all out like that. Obviously, a lot we still don't know, but based on that, uh, what do you make of Koberger's criminal profile at this point? Okay, so I'm going to leave it there for now. We might come back to that a little bit later. Have you have you not gotten a bit of a sense? Like um, I thought, Ashley Banfield covered the Chris Watts case really, really well, and and she's also been covering this case really, really well. But as I say, you then get things like, you know, what happened with the. Uh, um mad greek restaurant you sort of had that thing where um the people there say coburger never came there right and then it appears in the mainstream media that he did he did come there and and so you kind of have these double narratives now starting to appear right yeah. and 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 basically what that starts to do is it 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 erodes trust in someone you either don't trust the mainstream media or you don't trust law enforcement in yeah. the lead up to the trial yeah no um yeah it's it's interesting i i, I don't i don't know i mean it's just i think that when things like that happen um you have to think about the fact that like the things that were printed that were not true uh, were probably not fact checked, and maybe now you know which uh, publications behind the scenes are fact checked and which ones are not. Did you visit the Mad Greek restaurant? I did. Yeah, I did. Um, I ate there with Brian Denton. Um, we were. How was the food? It's great. That that's okay. the ball of mystery mush that I referenced in the article. Okay. It was like one of the things that was brought out with hummus, but we couldn't really figure out what it was. But Brian really liked it. Um, he's really upbeat and positive about it, everything. Yeah. It was a it was a nice place, and it was it was you know sad to think about Zana and Maddie working there. And, yeah. Did you sit inside? Yeah, we sat inside and our server was um, a former coworker and a neighbor of the victims. 
And uh, so he and Brian had, you know, a quick chat about that, but it's just a very, it's an extremely small uh, community and everyone really knows each other. So something I haven't asked you about yet that I'm really curious about is um, what is the culture in Moscow? How does it sort of feel different to another place? That's a, that's a really good question. I love Moscow. It's, it's small. Um, it has, you know, about 20,000 people and about half of uh, those are, are students. It's beautiful. Like it, Idaho is beautiful in a way that I was unprepared for. You know, the sky was just as white as the snow and it would like reflect and cast shadows and it was blue and white and beautiful. Um, and the culture is, because it's a college town, the culture is sort of like a mix of academic and um, agricultural, uh, just because of the industry in the area. And there's also a sort of like artsiness and eccentricity that's really baked into the town's history. It's sort of been that way ever since it was started. Um, the first Footloose and fancy free. Sorry? Sort of footloose and fancy free, kind of bo bo bohemian. Bohemian, that's a really, really uh, good word for it. I think the first graduating class at University of Idaho um, it might have been 1898. I don't remember exactly, but it was four people in the graduating class and two of them were women. So I don't know. I think that that just sort of tells you a lot about what the place is like. And the corner club is the kind of place where mechanics hang out with professors. You know, there's a real sort of um, cross cultural mm. uh, symbiosis happening that was it, it's just great. I really want to go back there. I, I would go back there just to visit. So when did you take any photos of the house at 1122? Did I take pictures of the house? I, I think I, I, I might have. I'm not really sure. Did, did um, we ever have like an encounter with, you know, you, you um, trying to take a photo, you may be taking notes and then a student walked by you and, and made a comment. Do you have anything like that? Yeah. So um, the students, you know, being young, they were very sweet. And so I mostly like felt their feelings of frustration and didn't really hear them. But on Brian's last night, uh, our last night together, um, he was showing uh, News Nation. He was doing a shot of where the killer might have walked if they did not park outside the house. So he was walking viewers down that road and he cut through an apartment complex um, parking lot. And these girls were getting out of a car and they sort of, they didn't say it loud enough for him to hear, but I heard it. So they were sort of talking to themselves for the most part, but just said, you know, get out of here. We don't want you here. And I, I apologized to them. I was like, we totally get it. If if we were you, we would hate us too. And they were like, no worries, you know. So these, just given their age, being in college, these kids are really sweet. But it did reach a point after we left, you know. I don't know if you saw, like, I think about a month ago, Nancy Grace set up outside the crime scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people across the street hung a sheet outside that said "fuck Nancy Grace." Yeah. Yeah. And so she had to look at it every day when she was at the, so they were definitely getting sick of it. Um, and, and I mean, that, that is, that is reality. That is how people feel. When I went to Pride Illusion Portugal to investigate the, and this is, you know, many years later, um, you're trying to take photos of apartment 5A and there are people who live there and they don't want that kind of negative narrative. And I felt like the hairs on my neck rise, like I need to look at this, I need to concentrate, but I'm very aware that there are people who live here and they want to live in peace, you know? Um, and, I, and I think it's very different. So that situation with the Madeleine McCann case, the entire area kind of the, the, the industry kind of collapsed, that hotel actually closed down, right? And if, if Moscow's not careful, and I think they are being careful, but if they're not careful, you could have a university that starts to contract. You can have neighborhoods that start to empty because yeah. there's this ghost, um, this, this sort of negative ghost, that, that this dark cloud that hovers over everything. And I think they're doing the right thing to, to 
what I, what I think a lot of true crime don't recognize is the, I, I know we just passed one hour mark, I'm not, a, not, not aware of that, but um, is Moscow is the university, right? Yeah. And so this is a, 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 a cut through the fabric of that society. And that, that cut is, does have to heal. Otherwise, the, the, that, that society is going to be dismantled. It's going to fall apart. It's going to be, in, it's going to be a lifelong injury. And we can either be part of that healing process where you authentically try and find out what happened here, or you can be part of cutting that cut even deeper where you, where you have witch hunts and you, you target. There's some, some of those survivors have got to go back to university. Yes. They want to complete, they want to finish something that they started. Yeah. And and is social media letting them do that? And and you might say, yeah, well, I want to find out, yeah, but what if it is your daughter? What if it is you? Yeah. Right? You just happen to be in the house, bad luck. Well, let's try and at least protect, you know. Yeah. Let's try and protect uh, these people. Yeah, absolutely. Um Mel, Mel still says, unfortunately, I have a feeling that Moscow is going to change a great deal. I hope not. I suppose once the trial's done, they can sort of do that. Can I chat to you another 10 minutes or do you want me to wrap up in 30 seconds? Well, <laughs> we can do a few more, a few more minutes, but I should probably, I should probably click off. Yeah, I just want to uh, uh, deal with a couple of comments here. Um, yeah. Do you agree that it's better to demolish the house? Oh gosh, I, I, what do you think, Nick? I mean, I, I think it's, I think it, there's probably been a lot of discussion about it, and it's what the community wants, and I think whatever they want makes sense. I mean, the. I think it's a it, it's a it's a shame. Like if I was D or B, I would feel like, but I want to, you know, um, it's probably a fait accompli. I mean something terrible happened in that house, you can't forget it, you can't move on, you can't just pretend it didn't happen. But in a way, I sort of wish, um, you know, does, in a way, I sort of feel like Brian, so Brian Cobra is the suspect here, we don't know for sure if he committed this crime, but whoever did commit this crime, if the intention was to hurt this community, then he succeeded. I mean, having this house that that was such a fulcrum of life and celebration have that literally destroyed have that basically taken off the you know the face of the earth isn't that you know in a way that the wet dream of this perpetrator you know yeah. i want to destroy lives i want to destroy your happiness because i don't have it and now you are you are allowing that to take place you know yeah it's interesting i mean there's a history of of crime scenes being raised right uh yeah with jeffrey dahmer they tore down the building uh and just thought that that would make it go away um with the slender man stabbing they raised the woods where where it occurred um yeah. and i wonder if it will accomplish what they want it to accomplish the demolition for me for me it's like the reality is a building is a building. The walls can't talk. The walls don't have memories. The walls didn't commit this crime. You know what I mean? And yeah. so surely if you can, I mean, I, I, my father's a builder and, and I, my, my sister studied architecture and I sort of feel like can't one do a little that changes the veneer of the building and, and then it can continue to serve its purpose. But to, to, to raise it, I understand that that, that is um nipping the social media in the because it's a it's a it's a what do you call it um it, it's a magnet for all the ghouls you know yeah. people that that sort of come in they, they don't want those people coming and so if you get rid of that you, you get rid of that problem but I, I i just find it almost like i find it quite sad i, I find it a bit of an indictment of our of our society that that we aren't better equipped to to deal with grief and trauma, that we've now got to destroy a building in order to deal with something. Isn't there another way we can engage with social media? And isn't there another way? Maybe you could have group tours where in, in on a one particular day everyone goes there and, and 
And there's there's something edifying about that process where people are, are told um, this is what happened, but also this is what's happening to our town. You know what I mean? Use that as an educational thing. I don't know. I don't know what the solution is, but it just seems this is a very rough uh, way of dealing with something. You know, if every time there's a crime, you demolish that building. You know what I mean? Is that the way to deal with with it? You know, isn't there another way to deal with? traumatic memory isn't there a more constructive way of, of you know yeah yeah so just i want to just go through two more questions one's from someone on patreon she said due to journalism being inundated with bloggers and sleuths i, I wouldn't quite call it journalism i'd just call it media coverage social media coverage she says when you interviewed Brian Enton, did you have any preconceived perceptions of Brian and did any of that change? Did, did meeting Brian in, in person change your perception of him? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so, what, yes, I did have preconceptions about Brian. I think my main one was just because I I knew him to be quite popular in social media. You know, he has a lot of Twitter followers and he tweets a lot. I thought that he would be sort of like more obsessed with, um, I don't know, with social media, with his follower count. I thought he would be like, you know, the kind of person who would be looking at how many likes things got. I don't know, not that that would have been bad, but um, it turned out that he just loved reporting and he had always wanted to be a reporter, always, always, always since he was a little kid. And he was just incredibly passionate about it. And the reason he was passionate about Twitter is because it allowed him to share what he was reporting to a wider array of people. And so he just ended up being much more down to earth than I thought he would be. So someone asked, uh, do you think the death penalty will be used? Quite a hardcore question. Well, if he's found guilty, then yes. I, I, and then... There's another question from Terry. She she asks. It's kind of what we've talk, spoken about, but just uh, just your um, your feeling. Um, how how did you feel the town has been affected? What was it? Was there things in the newspaper? Like when you went there, were there things in the newspaper that you read? Were they? Were, were you aware of anything where um, something like? Because I I can imagine that in university classes at university of idaho um that lecturers and students and, and even in the student core i'm sure there's been a discussion guys don't go don't go and watch these youtubers don't encourage them don't feed the machine in other words uh, we can be part of the solution by just ignoring it we we, we but, you know by every time you click every time you view you feed that monster mm -hmm. and i wonder whether there's not been like a private internal thing let's block that out you know there was definitely a coordinated effort among the the greek houses to have a united front um I, with the media and with social media that's not, interesting not yeah. posting, setting profiles to private yeah so that was definitely happening when i was there because I noticed um, there's this because I read like I try to read all the comments that I get. I get hundreds, if not thousands. I try to read as many as I can just to be in tune with my audience. But there's a point where I suddenly saw lots of people that I've never seen before saying this is just speculation, and, and I'm not a speculation channel. I mean, if I do um, if I do speculate, it's anchored in evidence. I mean, it's not like just raw. So, so, so I kind of got the feeling someone has told them to say that. Yeah. I don't know. That's the sense I got. I, I, I could, because there were a lot of people that I've never seen before, all saying the same thing. Yeah. And I got, I got a sense that, that it was a coordinated thing. And but, but you obviously didn't know my channel because I'm the least speculative channel. Well, one of the least, I guess. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us, Kathleen. Um, you were the last thing I want to mention is you had a book thing yesterday, right? Oh, it was actually I was going to a friend's book event. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. And you're writing a book on this case, right? 
no, I'm not. I am just writing these two articles about it. Um, and I mean, I, I think like you and your, your subscribers, I will definitely be paying close attention to the trial whenever that happens. Okay. Um, but yeah. Are you writing any other book? Um, no, the last one that came out in August, um, I'm giving myself, it, that one took five years. So I'm giving myself, I'm not like you. <laughs> so I'm giving myself some time to figure out what the next one's going to be about. And until then working on sort of smaller projects. Well, I've written a book that took two years and then it, and then there's a 20 year hiatus. And then I kind of rewrote it, re, re, worked it so i have written a uh i have written something that took like basically 22 years wow. so I'm, I'm aware of the long writing thing and and then also the very very quick writing thing i know it's amazing you're so prolific but haven't you found you know like you, some of your your writing is long form right long form especially for vanity fair it reads like a chapter. It's that kind of writing that translates very well to a book. It's interesting. You know? Yeah. I mean, we'll see. You know, sometimes you don't know that you're writing a book until. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a cryptic thing in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Last thing. Are you going to watch the Oscars? No, I won't. I've never really been into the Oscars. I Not, don't know. Okay. Why. Yeah, I'm quite weird. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I wish I were the kind of person to have like an Oscars party and come up with some okay. kind of game with them. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to your um, additional uh, coverage on this case. And um, I'd love to actually have you as a guest sometime in the future, talking about writing, talking because I do a TCRS book club. Yeah. And, you know, some of the more edifying stories you've read and some of the more edifying stories you've written. So if you, you know, if you want to come back, we'd love to have you. I would love that. I would really love that. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone in chat. I'm sorry I wasn't able to deal with everyone's questions. Terry says, do you have a channel we can support? Oh, that's so sweet of you guys. Um, I have a website, KathleenHale.org, and it has um, links to my books. Uh, my name is Kathleen Hale. Uh, you can also find my most recent book, It's True Crime, It's Nonfiction, Slender Man, about the Slender Man stabbings. You can find that on Amazon. And I'm a very guilty in that because you sent me a thing to read. Um, I'm afraid if I don't have the book, I'm a, I'm very I'm a kind of a bit of a two face. I, a lot of my books are on Kindle, yeah. My books are on Kindle, but I'm very bad at reading Kindle books. I need I sort of need this sort of thing. If I don't see it on my bookshelf, I tend to read a little and then I move on. Um, I'm I'm definitely I'm old, I like I write like scribbling little notes. So yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, some things change. Some things don't change. Some things, I guess, do change. Anyway, uh, again, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for narrating uh, that article. And um, I'm just going to put a link. It, to it always strikes me from the very first time. I just want to put a link to that, uh, to the article in chat just before we, we head off. There we go. Okay. So, guys, if you want to follow um, Kathleen Hale, it's Kathleen Hale dot org right yeah. any plans to start a youtube channel we could do with more authentic voices like yours oh it's so sweet um i i just i think i'm i mean you've you know i've talked about this before but i, I think i'm i think i'm too shy and i'm gonna leave it to to the masters like like you and i'll just sit in my home my <laughs> writing you know scribbling. the 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 secret um that nobody knows is i'm actually quite shy i actually don't like doing lives i actually do a lo lot fewer than everybody else oh you would but... never know yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks so much for joining us enjoy the rest of your weekend and we hope to see yeah. you again okay thank you thanks guys okay. take care bye-bye